Once again, good afternoon. And so this track of the conference, as you know, focuses on industry innovation, new sources of growth. And this session in particular is focusing on accelerating distributed ledger technology adoption through innovative regulations. We will have a presentation and then we will have a panel discussion afterwards. I'd like to encourage you to have a look at the biographies of the speakers and panelists on the CSR website. Uh, it's truly a privilege to be in the company of such highly accomplished individuals. And before we begin, I'd like to ask that you also just turn off your cell phones or turn them onto silent to avoid disruption. And without further ado, let's turn to our first presentation. The title of it is Research Development and Innovation Approaches to Regulating Distributed Ledger Technology. It is presented by Karol de Jager, who is the research group leader of Distributed Ledger Te Technology, or DLT, at the CSR. Karol, the stage is yours. Feel free to, to come forward. Thank you. No, it's all right. I'll use this mic. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lama. All right, yeah. So, um, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is stuff that we built in our research group. So, just to uh, keep that in mind, uh, the talk was developed with that backdrop. So, what you see on the screen right now is a Bitcoin private key. Now, you can scan this private key and you can claim the funds. It's yours. Whoever is first, uh, there's about enough money uh, allocated to this private key to buy you lunch. So it's not a lot. But anyone in this audience here today can scan it. And whoever's first, uh, the money is yours. So assuming that one of you already did it, uh, if you're quick on your fingers, or will do it soon, that transaction was instant, it was borderless, it was free, open, transparent, censorship resistant. And although you sat in the audience here today, and you took that money. We just did a digital transaction in which I sent you value. And you could have been anywhere in the world. You didn't have to be in this room here today. You could have been in another, another country. You could have been in Asia. You could have been in any continent around the world. So yeah, Bitcoin is amazing. It allows us to send value uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer manner instantly, basically for free. Um, in, and it's a game changer for non-discriminatory financial inclusion. That is true, and I can talk about that the whole day. And I wish I could. But today, we're going to talk more about the problems that it poses for regulators. Because whoever got that money now, and by the way, it's still on the screen. You can still scan it. Uh, it'll be there for a couple of slides. Whoever got the money now um, received value from me. Uh, and it, although the, in this case, it was just lunch money, it could have been potentially billions of rands. And there was no application process. There was no KYC. There was no documentation that you had to give me or anyone else. You didn't have to present your ID number, your, your, your proof of residence or anything else. Um, there was no checks done for money laundering. It was pseudonymous. I don't know who you are. It was crossing borders potentially. And it would be impossible to censor that transaction, to stop it or to, efficient, or to regulate it efficiently. So, I mean, it's a massive headache for regulators, right? Imagine we did that transaction through a conventional bank, it would have been completely different. So what do regulators do? How do they tackle this? Well, there's also opportunity. Because the blockchain is 100% transparent and auditable. You don't need permission or any application to transact, but you also don't need any permission or application to audit. So anyone in the world can find the, transaction, the, the financial statements that led to that transaction. Uh, for the last 10 years, without going through a court process, without getting a subpoena, anyone that has the ability to look and the software that's smart enough to analyze the data can look, can find that history. You can get a lot of intelligence from that transaction. And we did that. So that transaction, which you just saw, is there, that little orange man in the, in the corner. There's the wallet, the one that you claimed with the lunch money, all right? Now, we don't know who that person is. Well, we do, because I told you it's me that did that transaction. So there's uh, about 100 witnesses here that can, that can testify that that's me. And then we don't know who the other people are that transacted with this Bitcoin, but we can trace it. 
And then finally, we find a familiar face there. That's Luno, all right? And we know that Luno uh, collects KYC data. They know who did that withdrawal, and they know the, the identity of the person that had the Bitcoin at that point in time. And then somewhere along the line, it branched off, and there's another, there's a competitor to Luna, which is Valor, and there's also identifying information. So we have an identity there. That's me, by the way. We have an identity here. That's also me, by the way. And we have an identity here. That's also me, because you all testified to it. But even if it wasn't me, if it was someone else, if we had some clever artificial intelligence and machine learning pattern recognition, then we could have very easily mapped the entire transactional history and tied identities to each and every transaction. So it's extremely powerful. But there's also some challenges for regulators. So the technology is moving at a rapid pace. It's almost impossible to keep up. So it's even impossible to keep up for us technologists. You can just imagine a regulator. And it's entering every sphere of our lives. Um, banks are becoming payment providers and shops. I mean, we all shop on f and on, or, or on, on your banking profile these days. Exchanges are becoming banks, payment systems, insurers. The whole industry is getting mixed. Anyone that, that, that controls money, uh, the lines that distinguishes these industries are getting erased. It's also a challenge for regulators to, to acknowledge the techn technological nuance. Um, so, uh, for instance, if I, can, if I can make an example, the FECA, one of the financial regulators in South Africa, recently declared crypto assets as financial products. It was big news. Um, and although that's a step in the right direction, I have to commend them for that. That's a brilliant move. They, uh, it, it, it has to be, uh, you have to imagine that now an NFT, which is in all essence a JPEG file that you can use as, an, as a Twitter profile picture, that is now a financial asset. And if you sell or buy that uh, asset, you need to pay capital gains tax on that. So that's a bit ridiculous. Um, and if you buy an in-gaming asset, for instance, you're a gamer, you play PlayStation or whatever, and you buy a gaming asset, that is now a financial transaction, this financial asset that you hold and you have to, and there's tax, tax obligations, exchange controls, and a whole lot of other regulations that now apply to that asset. So you have to have a lot of technological nuance when you regulate this industry. Uh, there's always the, the threat of grey listing by global watch, watch bodies, such as FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, which is a global financial regulator um, that threatens uh, South Africa with being grey listed. And grey listed is one, just one step from being sanctioned, right? So it's, it's a major, major, major threat. And if the regulator don't, uh, you know, uh, stamp down on this industry very, very firm and, and set the boundaries, then, then the next step for South Africa will be sanctioned. And then there's a great war between permissionless innovation and conventional um, uh, compliance that's warming up. Um, so, yeah, let me not get into that. That's too technical for today. So how do you solve this as a regulator? Well, we've identified four areas where the regulator can focus. Number one, it is to build and manage a digital asset surveillance engine. As I just showed you, there's a whole lot of intelligence that you can get from these transactions. So the regulators should use it. They should build the software and use it because that'll solve a lot of their problems. Um, should build a robust automated solution, software solution towards the travel rule and exchange controls to account for the assets that moving between these service providers that moving in and out of South Africa. Uh, they should have custody services because at some point the regulator is going to have to confiscate or seize these assets. What are they gonna do with it? Uh, custody is a major problem in, in this world. Whoever took the Bitcoin now, you'll re realize that pretty quickly. And they need a whole lot of technical R&D. They need less lawyers and accountants and more engineers. So let me spend a minute or so on each of these use cases. So first of all, chain analysis and surveillance. At the CSR, we are building products um, related to this. Uh, it's a big focus of ours. So there are international players that does these kind of things, that, that harvests, that harvest, that's, that's harvesting the data of the blockchain and then processing it in such a way that you can, you, you can, you can allocate the risk score to a transaction, and, um, uh, you know, uh, giving it a likelihood of being money laundering or a terrorist financing transaction. So there are international players, but there's none in the southern hemisphere, and I think a local product can be extremely beneficial. Because if you have this data, it becomes a strategic asset to the state. Because now, with that asset, you can assess the operational risks of local crypto asset service providers, the companies that deal with this technology. Um, for instance, you can track their liquidity position and their reserve status, track the volumes of assets that's traded, etc. 
And to give you an example of why that is so important, there's a picture there. Where it's pixelated a little bit on purpose because it shows one of the CASPs in South Africa that was speculating with user assets and now potentially lost it. Um, in, the, in the region of 100 to 150 million rand. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's big damage. And we can prevent stuff like that if we have uh, local intelligence. We can investigate illicit finance schemes, tax evasion, money laundering, terrorist financing efficiently and, and, and quickly. We can implement local regulations that's not applicable to the rest of the world, like, for instance, exchange controls and local tax, tax laws. We can have our own sanctioned addresses um, and, and enforce that on, 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 on the local players. Um, we can assess the fairness of local crypto asset service providers um, and a whole lot of other stuff that we can do. And global products, on top of what we can do with our own local product, global products are also extremely expensive and only affordable to a, to a select few. So there's no support for SMMEs in South Africa when it comes to this. Um, you know, a, a very small local CASP cannot really do effective monitoring or surveillance of the blockchain and, and is potentially a loophole for money laundering. Um, and you require extremely highly specialized skills. This is not very easy. You, you need developers, engineers, statisticians, AI, and machine learning experts, and we have that. We have that in CSR. So the second thing is travel rule and exchange controls. Currently, this is, a, this is open for all. I, I don't know how many of you are aware, but you're only allowed to take one million rand out of South Africa per year per individual. Uh, there's no way to enforce that currently with crypto. It's a free for all. You can take as much out of the country as you want. So um, this, don't tell the Gupta, say. So, uh, so uh, we need to fix that, and we can do that with, with software. With some clever, smart software, we can build the software that, 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 automate, that automates the uh, compliance of, of this. Thirdly, the crypto asset custody products. This is an extremely difficult problem to solve. So um, the, who does a crypto asset belong to? If you have Bitcoin, is it yours? How do you know it's yours? If the... If the uh, uh, regulator needs to confiscate some of these assets. What do they do to it? They cannot pick someone with a phone and say, okay, we, we're sending it to you. Um, you know, this is potentially billions of rands in the order of that. So, um, so they need to start thinking of this. They need to start developing these solutions to ensure that they have the means to, to take control of these assets as well. And then lastly, they, they, they need a, a team of uh, technical experts to help them appreciate the techn technological nuance of this technology. As I just said, uh, as I just mentioned, the FSEA that declared um, crypto assets financial products, um, which I just have to repeat, it's a step in the right direction. But they need these experts to contribute to policy and standards and advice on, on, on per, per position papers re, uh, related to anything that has to do with crypto assets, including central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. They need to keep a close eye on the industry development and understand the technical constraints. They need cryptographic skills, those are scarce. Um, and they need a framework, for instance, for conducting due diligence on crypto-related investment products. This was a recommendation by the SAR governor himself during a speech a couple of months ago. And then lastly, products for automating tax returns. This is another headache. Um, SARS have no idea how much tax you need to pay when you invest in these products. And we can build the software to automate this. And uh, we focus. We focus on, on a lot of these things. Uh, our main focus is, is currently on harvesting your data, processing it, and reducing um, risk scores and outcomes uh, to the regulator or to accountants and lawyers that need this technology and need to do investigations in it uh, at the CSRR. So that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. That was uh, to the minute. Any questions from the, from the audience? Any questions for Carl? Okay, I see there are two hands. I'll start here and then I'll go there. Please go ahead, sir. Hello, Carl. Uh, based on what you just said now, uh, what do you think about uh, Nano S ledgers? Because uh, in terms of cyber security, when it comes to exchanges that you just show here, I feel like uh, the security is not that much. What do you think about Nano S Ledger in terms of security into cryptocurrency? Thank you. It's a major issue. So, um, and, and it all starts with custody, and it all starts with uh, the institution being unaccountable, because currently there's very little accountability to these institutions and all these um, um, assets. There's also no insurance. So, 
um, you know, if if one of these institutions gets hacked and the and the and the, and the funds get stolen, uh, that's ultimately um, filtered down to the user. So you, as the investor in these institutions, will suffer, um, and that's part of what these tools can actually solve. So it's not an unsolvable problem; it's actually an easy problem to solve, but it's not being enforced. Okay. Another thing, question, uh, last question: What do you think about the security tokens? STO uh, backed by real asset, which is like gold or real estate. Oh yeah, that's an interesting question. And we should maybe reserve that one for the panel as well. I know Viana has some stuff to say about that. Um, security tokens um, and securitizing, um, you know, uh, real world assets. So that's a very interesting question. And, um, and yeah, I think it's a massive use case. It's going to take off sooner rather than later. Um, and uh, you know, and I bring bring the magic of blockchain to real world assets, borderless transactions, twenty four seven, free and open, transparent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll take the one question there, and that will be our last question. Hi, Carl. Um, I just want to know uh, the whole point of Satoshi Nakamoto creating Bitcoin and the blockchain was decentralization, and with all of this security talk we are talking about and regulation. I feel as if the, the means are defeating the ends. Um, I was also going to ask about tokenization, uh, but uh, I'll wait for Marius to, to, to tell us more about that uh, tokenization of real assets uh, on the blockchain. Yeah. Yeah, tokenization is what I just mentioned. It's, uh, it's um, you know, recording securities on the blockchain and bringing the magic of blockchain to, to, to real world assets. Um, in terms of what uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's ideals are, I agree with you. And uh, you know, I'm a Bitcoiner, uh, inside and out. But this information is in the public domain. So, I mean, it's there for anyone to take. You, you, you can do it yourself as well. You can go into the, into the blockchain. You can read whatever you, you'd, you'd like to read. So uh, we're just building software to do that faster. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, and in the end, theft is theft. Um, doesn't matter how you look at it, whether it's decentralized or centralized theft. Theft is theft and it's illegal and, and should be stamped out. And, you know, harming, an, harming, harming a fellow individual is not right um, in any jurisdiction around the world. So uh, that's, that's what we're trying to prevent. We're trying to, in the end, protect the customer. Thank you. There was actually that hand, yeah. and, but uh, okay. Please go ahead and then you'll be the last one. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, yes. my name is Oba King. I'm from uh, a company that's developed a platform for the minibus called After Robot. So one of the, the elements we're looking at is uh, up to this point, right, with Bitcoin, uh, trusted units of value has been currency. But, I mean, uh, what's your thought around uh, having other elements of, uh, as long as in the trust network we can agree that other elements can become trusted units of value. So thinking about things like um, commuter requests uh, or, or when, rather, my point is, uh, instead of having the, the, you know, the extensive maths becoming what people then make as work, can't what people do as normal transactions then become the thing that becomes the triggering events to create the blockchain. I find that most of these instances, it's about payments and Bitcoin, but yeah. there should be other, other elements. What's your take on that? Other use cases of blockchain technology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, they, they certainly are. They certainly are. I just think that the magic happens in finance. Um, really, that's where, the, that's where the boundaries are pushed in terms of innovation. Yeah. This technology um, allows you to move value the same way we move inf information. Yeah. Um, you know, currently, you don't, if, if you send an email to someone across the world, you don't think when it's going to arrive, how much it's going to cost, how much it's going to be left when it arrives. Mm. When you send money across the borders to someone else, you do think of all of that stuff. Uh, is it going to arrive? Is it, is it banking hours in that country? How much is going to be less? How much is it going to cost? You, know, you never know. So, um, and this technology allows you to treat money in the same way that we treat information. And that's profound. Okay. That's, 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 to me, is, is really where the boundaries are pushed in terms of innovation.